but the energy level was the was the aha moment. It was like, oh my god, I used to think that we eat sugar to have energy, but here I stop the sugar and I have much more energy. So- Hello, everyone. Today, I'm thrilled to chat with Asma Lalou, a certified chef from CNM London and the co-founder of My Authentic Spoon. With a philosophy centered around establishing healthy habits rather than imposing restrictions, Asma is an advocate for holistic well-being. Seven years ago, she personally experienced a remarkable transformation, shedding 12 kilograms and gaining abundant energy. Today, we'll delve into detox plants and environmental toxins. Now, please welcome Asma. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Severine, for having me on your show. It's our pleasure. Let's start with the beginning. You lost 12 kilograms, which is about two stones or 26 pounds, seven years ago. What were the game changer factors or changes in your lifestyle that contributed to this amazing transformation? I think there have been many, I think many things. Maybe I need to start by telling you that I have always been overweight a little bit. Uh, In my family, I was the one that was overweight. I always had a sweet tooth as well. My first job that where I was basically in, in a confectionery company, so chocolate company to be to be de- more detailed. So I indulged almost every day actually on chocolate bars and ice cream and things of that sort. I used to travel a lot for my job. And uh, so I was actually basically eating in airports, hotels, restaurants. That was part really of my routine. Stress level was quite high. And maybe that was another reason for me to compensate through food. So that was like my background to start with. Um, and maybe I think what made my kind of personal bucket overflow and then take more, again, more weight than just the usual four, five, six kilos that, 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 that was extra is maybe the three years that we spent in the U.S., uh, which basically uh, the, the, where the lifestyle was not necessarily the best in terms of um, sed- sedentary lifestyle. Um, and and I think exposure as well to a lot of hormones that were we did not have in Europe as much. So all that actually uh, made made me gain a lot of weight. Um, at that time, I beca- yes, I was about reaching my 40s. Uh, I was already very tired, fatigued all the time. And um, I, I had kids like the, the, the younger one was two, three years old, and I was not able to play with them and hold them and carry them in the stairs and things of that sort. So that started bothering me a little bit, thinking, oh, my God, I'm not even 40, and I'm in this kind of health and shape, etc., on the other side, um, my family is is in Morocco, and we have many people who suffer from diabetes or hypertension and other metabolic problems, kidney problems, etc. So I was looking at all that and thinking, hmm, I'm approaching maybe the same kind of health because this is my family history, and I need to do something about it. But never, there was not never uh, like I think a big trigger, but it was there. I think in the background. Uh, but really, the big change for me actually happened eight years ago. Uh, it was on a January, the 1st of January 2016, where I decided to stop sugar. I had a very sweet tooth and still I decided to go sugar free for a month and challenge myself and, and see what happened. Because I actually, I at that time, I was crazy enough to wanting to launch a like a Moroccan tea room. Uh, and, and having those amazing Moroccan pastries that I love, and I wanted to make them like available in London and, and have a, a kind of a premium offering, which I did not find locally. I was always bringing Moroccan sweets from uh, from uh, from Morocco. So at that time, this is this is what I was trying to launch, and actually all the um, kind of uh, all my browsing online brought me into the. Um, the, the issues about sugar and what it was doing uh, to our body. And as I was overweight and I, I, well, with all the background that I was sharing with you, I started thinking, okay, well, you know what? Give yourself just a month. This is a sugar-free one-month challenge. Let's try that and see what happens. And this is where the big change really happened for me. I lost three kilos, which is not huge, but the energy level was the, was the aha moment. It was like, oh my God, I used to think that we eat sugar to have energy, but here I stop the sugar and I have much more energy. 
So I decided actually to go a little bit further and I started kind of educating myself on a paleo diet, trying to reduce my processed food intake and reducing even my carbs. And as I was doing that for a couple of months, uh, I actually lost 12 kilos, which was really amazing. But for me, I think the biggest the biggest change and, and what triggered the maybe the change in my life really was something that I was not expecting. I have a, a, a tumor, a benign tumor in uh, the, the brain, in the pituitary gland. And I had that since the birth of my first child. Um, and I was taking medication for that. But actually that tumor grew each time I was breastfeeding and it shrank back when I was not. And it was like that each time with the pregnancy and breastfeeding. Uh, but the medication did not change it. What I did, actually, I just went for my annual MRI. And here, this time, the tumor completely disappeared from the MRI. It was still secreting some hormone, but, but not as much. Not as much. And that was, that was the biggest change in my life. So it's not really the weight loss was kind of, it made sense. But the triggering, the, the big triggering for me to change my lifestyle and, and to change my career, actually, was uh, with this um, hormonal imbalance that was kind of treated without me doing anything about it. Wow, that's such an amazing story. So how did this personal transformation lead you to pursue becoming a certified chef at CNM London? And in what way has this shaped your approach to promoting healthy eating? My kind of health transformation was beyond weight loss, that what I was pursuing is weight loss. I wanted actually to share that with people. I wanted to raise awareness, educate people around me, even about the weight loss part, because I tried so many times to lose the weight. As I mentioned, I was overweight almost all my life. I, I always had that sweet tooth and then having three, four, five kilos extra was the norm for me. And I tried many things to lose weight, but it was never sustainable. Um, especially after the kids, it was really difficult. So this time it, it was there. And, and actually I, do, I did it very slowly without necessarily feeling deprived. Uh, before each time I went on a diet, I really felt deprived. And here, I think the change was different. That's why I think it's a sustainable weight loss that I have done because it's, the approach is very different. I'm an engineer by training, so I need to understand the why and the how uh, to be able to explain it first to myself, explain it to people and convince them actually to make the change because the change is not easy, to be honest. Any change that we do in our diet or lifestyle is not easy. So people have to be motivated and convinced actually by what they are doing. This is really what brought me into CNM is the credential part. First, I wanted to understand myself, how the whole thing happened and, and why. And once it was, it sank in, etc. I was able as well to share it with people uh, through better food choices and how to cook differently and how to cook for your health, actually. And you emphasize creating healthy habits instead of restriction. So how do you find the sweet spot between promoting health and allowing for enjoyable indulgences or treats in a person's diet? If you had asked me only for kind of one word to answer this question, I would say education. For me, uh, when people understand how the body works, why it behaves in a way or another, and why they're getting those annoying symptoms like fatigue and difficulty concentrating and their work, itchy skin, painful joints, other like worse situations and autoimmune disease. Why do they get it? Why did they have it? When you start understanding the why first you got it in the first place, your willingness to make the change is much higher. This is really what I realized with myself. The more I was reading, understanding, watching actually videos and TED Talks about the sugar and all that, it made me understand the impact that has on my health, on my energy level and all that. Then I was like, okay, well, now I understand. Now let's, let's go into the step of making the change and see what happens. Actually, what I realized is that part of education is really key. The second part is what I want is people to have a significant improvement at quite quickly in their life. So what I usually do in my programs is I start with a reset. We try to give the best conditions for the body actually to come back to homo homeostasis as quickly as possible. As much as possible. Not It's not always possible 100%, but as much as possible in terms of percentage. For those who don't know, what is homeostasis? So homeostasis is basically, it's kind of a state of balance, of harmony, optimal functioning for the body, uh, where 
the body would actually have a certain heartbeat, a certain temperature, a certain metabolism. Basically, when the body is working normally, it is always in the state of homeostasis. When there are disruptions, when there is maybe too much stress, like an imbalance of uh, nutrients that arrive, some of them are higher, some of them are lower than what you need things are not working as they should. So the kind of chemical processes in the body don't happen as they should, and therefore things are out of whack, basically. So what we try to do is come back to that homeostasis. We give as much as possible the best conditions for a small period of time, what I call a reset. For example, in our detox program, we do a 10-day detox, and we try to give the best condition for our body to to come back to, to that homeostasis uh, situation. In a, in a weight loss program, it's over usually an eight-week program, but the reset, like the metabolic reset, is three weeks. We give three weeks to the group to lower inflammation, to stabilize insulin, to boost uh, the metabolic rate as well. And all that actually is by an, an effort. So for me, this is something which is key to come back to, to feel better. When you feel better quickly, you that's part of the motivation as well to aha, uh -huh. so actually I did just 10 days and I feel much better in my PMS, for example, or I feel much better with my skin or in my mood. Oh my God, then I'm, I'm now willing to keep some kind of percentage of those habits that I learned with you. Not everything. I mean, we, we try to do the best situation, but usually what I notice that people will keep about 20% of the changes. So from all the lists that I usually recommend, they would maybe keep 20%. And those 20, 20%, we try to help them to select them so that that brings them about 80% of the benefits. And this is usually what happens is not, you don't have to be, uh, have a perfect life, like uh, the perfect diet, a very clean diet, etc., to feel great. With just 20% of the change, you can feel like 80% of the benefits. And, and by nourishing your body on a daily basis, like 80% of the days, 80% uh, of the time you're nourishing your body and giving it the nutrient it needs, it definitely can handle exceptions. It definitely can handle treats and indulgences, etc. Unless, unless there is a serious condition. So if there is an autoimmune disease, if there is something like chronic disease that we have for a long time, it requires much more effort or it requires maybe a longer elimination or maybe sometimes a permanent elimination. So if we have a Crohn's disease or a disease where we have really a problem with a specific group of foods, then sometimes it requires a permanent uh, elimination. But, the, but, but there are so many workarounds to have pleasure from food. So treats and pleasures, we can still have them actually from food. And there are so many very nice recipes as well. Uh, you mentioned the world detox. So let's dive into the world of detox. Detox, detoxification. Can you explain what detox means? Uh, what prompts the need for detox, although you've started to explain that? And how can one recognize a successful detox? Basically, the way I explain detoxification is like this is a like a daily housekeeping that we do in our body, okay, to get rid of toxic substances and wanted substances, whether it's internal or external. So this takes place every day. And more specifically, every night when we are sleeping, sleep is very important for detoxification. And the main organ for detoxification is the liver. So the liver would get the toxins that would come, the internal toxins, but the external toxins would come from different parts of the body. So from the skin, from the lungs, from the food that we eat as well. And all that actually would come through the blood and the lymph. Okay, so these all these elements are important to bring to the liver the toxins. So the, the, the liver would take these toxins, would transform them into a form that allow them to exit the body in a way that is not going to be harmful for the elimination organs. So our elimination organs are the colon, the kidneys, the skin, and the lungs. This is how our toxins would leave the body. And for them to leave the body, they need to be in a water-soluble form. Our toxins are not always water-soluble. They can be in a fat-soluble form, and that requires a lot of work actually to transform them into the water-soluble form and to leave the body. So what basically happens, you don't need asthma or you don't need my authentic spoon detox program actually to, to do a detox. It happens every day and every night. We estimate that like a hundred years ago, humans were exposed to about 5% of the toxins we face nowadays. Our 
detoxification system and organs are really overworked. And that's maybe part of the, the problem. The second thing that I want to share with you is like there are three factors that can hinder optimal detoxification. We go into much more detail in our masterclass. We have a masterclass which is pre-recorded to explain actually the concepts of this. But uh, just to give you like the, the, the key elements so that you can understand what is happening in the background. If we don't sleep enough, we usually need between six to eight hours. Some people need nine hours. If we don't listen to our body, if we don't sleep enough, and especially if we don't sleep enough during the hours that the, ha the, the detox Detoxification happens. Some people actually sleep very late and then they say, well, I'll have a nap to catch up. But actually detoxification does not happen during the, the nap, actually. It really happens during the, the night, usually between 10, 11 in the evening until 3, 4 in the morning, roughly this kind of hours. So if you're sleeping later, you're not uh, allowing your liver to do the detox detoxification as much as it could have done during that night. That's one thing. Then if you think about your meals, if you're having, for example, a heavy meal towards the evening, and this is we, what we usually do, we do, sorry, for our social meals, like with our family, with our friends, we'll have maybe a late dinner, 8, 9 p.m., and we finish around 10, 11 p.m., and it's not the lightest meal, it's not maybe a soup and a bone broth or something of that sort. No, 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 it's something quite heavy and we want pleasure and we want dessert and all that is a lot to digest. And that's not a problem, but as it is late in the evening, this kind of meal will require a certain energy actually to be digested, okay? This energy that you, your body will spend in digesting this heavy meal will not spend it in detoxification, specifically that it will take hours actually to digest this meal. Maybe it will take four, five, six hours to digest it. Those hours are actually the hours you wanted to spend in detoxification. So you see the kind of problems that we, we are creating for ourselves, not every day, but we are maybe doing that at least once a week if, it not, if it's not more. And maybe the last part is the nutrient part. So the liver requires an amount of nutrients actually to uh, convert those toxins from a fat-soluble form into a water-soluble form. And it in the process, it creates a lot of free radicals, which create inflammation. So we require a lot of antioxidant, anti-inflammatories, the uh, nutrients that we need actually to support just the liver do the work, but also our other elimination organs need nutrients just to function correctly. Now, what prompted like the need for, for detox and why I, I see it as something very important and I, I made sure that actually it's one of the key programs that we do. We start actually with, with people on that. The first thing is I had a, my, myself a very bad experience with detox uh, before I got trained in CNM. For me, a detox was from all what I gathered online. Basically, I read a book, I gathered many information online and I thought, okay, now I'm an engineer. I'm able to create my own detox program. And I created a program based on mainly plants, rich in smooth smoothies and juices and salads and things of that sort and uh, thinking that's basically what we need to detox but I was missing some key elements like B vitamins and a like more sulfur rich foods and proteins I did, almost did not have any protein in, in in those elements and I realized later on when I was training with CNM how important proteins are for detoxification. Basically, I got myself sick after five days. I was really sick. Like I got like um, a, a big flu. When you do a bad detox is, is when you get sick, like what I did to myself. The second reason for me detox is so important is because many people that come to us in our programs, they come with many, many symptoms that can be solved so quickly actually by improving detoxification. So the first one is fatigue, brain fog. Uh, itchy skin, eczema, respiratory problems like asthma uh, or just not breathing correctly, digestive issues, bloating, constipation, food allergies or intolerances. Many things actually can be improved. I'm not saying that just a 10-day detox can fix everything. No, no, no. It can be improved. It sometimes requires a little bit longer. Uh, and then you have a whole host of like hormonal issues like PMS or heavy bleeding or painful periods. And this, this basically comes back to having too much estrogen, what we call estrogen dominance, where your estrogen that is supposed to be detoxified by the liver, by the colon, as they are overworked and maybe a little bit clogged and not the one they were properly, your estrogen build up and you start having tender breasts, being very moody, all those things are just a detoxification does not happen correctly. By 
allowing yourself to have like a 10 day or even shorter, it could be shorter period of time where you give the best conditions to your body to reset, you can see an improvement really quite quickly. What can I expect when I do a a good detox or a successful detox, right? Mm. That was the, that was the last part of your question. I think it really depends on how rigorous the person is doing her detox. I have many recommendations usually. I want I want the best for people, so I try to change many things at once because what I want is for them to feel a significant improvement in their health so that I motivate them to keep some of the habits long term. This is really my approach and this really what has, has worked for my clients so far. So people who participate in the program, they, they don't keep, as I mentioned, all the habits. They keep some of them. But the improvement has been so significant that it's like, oh, okay, I love it and I want to continue. Towards the end of the detox, basically, feeling energized definitely is one of the biggest things. Sleeping better, feeling lighter. This comes back many times and it's not about weight. I mean, we we could lose one to two kilos, but that's max what we do. But the, the, the lighter, I think, is the fact that toxins are not there and all that fatigue that used to be there because uh, the toxins were not el- enabling the normal hormonal exchanges to, to happen, the normal enzymatic processes to happen. All those things now are kind of relieved and they Therefore, uh, cells start working properly and that's why we feel lighter. So that's maybe the biggest thing that comes back very quickly from, from people. The second one is a significant reduction in hormonal uh, issues like PMS, bloating, hormonal imbalances. For example, the for blood sugar, it requires a little bit more, but people start feeling like, oh, I'm much more balanced. I don't have those cravings as much. So all those things are actually very much linked to each other. And for them to take 10 days and to notice the difference, this is exactly what I want, is for them to notice and then to say, okay, so from all what I have tried, I'm going to keep maybe a different breakfast. Okay, fair enough. This is great. Already a good change. Okay, so th- these are like examples of significant changes. Skin skin issues, many things actually can get much better in terms of uh, eczema. Uh, acne can get much uh, much better if it was like an a hormonal acne. There could be some improvements in digestive issues, but maybe it requires longer. So if it, there was chronic uh, constipation, There is a a slight improvement, but it usually requires much more work to be done to heal the guts. Well, obviously you focus on natural whole foods. Are there specific friendly food recommendations that you use to support this body's natural detoxification process? Just to be honest, I cannot go into too much detail right now with you because it's it's very detailed. So I really recommend people to go and check out the masterclass. It explains everything in detail. But what I can share with you is the highlights. So basically what our body needs is antioxidants. There are two types of antioxidants. You have the water-soluble antioxidants like vitamin C. This is usually what people concentrate on is vitamin C, antioxidant, vitamin C. But we have a much more powerful antioxidant called glutathione. Glutathione can be found in food, but actually it's much better to create it ourselves because it's not absorbed as much through food and through uh, supplementation as well. It's much better actually to create your own glutathione. Not just a very powerful, it's maybe the master antioxidant and it's water soluble and it helps so much actually with with detoxification and supporting the liver uh, through the process. But also all the others, the the fat-soluble antioxidants, vitamin A, vitamin E, beta-carotene, and and, and all the other flavonoids that are rich in antioxidants, uh, but also things like minerals like zinc, selenium, very powerful antioxidant, silymarin. Silymarin is something that we find in um, milk thistle. So that's why you hear many times milk thistle is very much recommended during detox because it's rich in silymarin. Silymarin is one powerful uh, antioxidant. If you don't like maybe the taste of, uh, of milk thistle in a herbal tea, for example, or you don't like adding it to your smoothie, uh, you could have artichokes. Artichokes as well contain silymarin. Selenium, you can find it in uh, Brazilian nuts. The richest one is uh, Brazilian nuts. So if you have maybe two to three Brazilian nuts a day, uh, that would be amazing. And that helps as well your thyroid to work. 
properly, etc. But then we need anti-inflammatory compounds that come from spices and herbs, for example. So spices that are anti-inflammatory are like uh, curcumin, so, so turmeric, sorry, uh, turmeric, ginger, uh, herbs like rosemary, hibiscus, dandelion. All those things are actually going to be very helpful for detoxification and bringing you some anti-inflammatory compounds to support your liver during that process that is very taxing, actually, that where we create a lot of free radicals, as I mentioned before, and that needs anti-inflammatory compounds. But then we come to, to kind of the meaty part. We need sulfur. We need a lot of sulfur. And sulfur we can get from onions, garlic, leek, but also from all the cruciferous uh, vegetables, the cauliflower, the broccoli, the kale, the Brussels sprouts, and, and things of that sort. Okay. Sulfur is one of the key elements to create glutathione. Glutathione needs sulfur and needs amino acids. So it needs protein. And that was the biggest mistake that I made when I tried to do my own detox. There was almost no protein in my diet for five days. And I was trying to detox and support my kind of uh, step one liver detox. But it was just, I was doing just the wrong things. Not, not doing the things in the right order, basically. We need B vitamins. And there are so many foods that are rich in B vitamins. But sometimes we tend actually to reduce them in the diet because they are either more difficult to digest or high in carbs, etc. So sometimes it's, it's good actually to have a supplement in B vitamins, the, a B complex. And some people have problems with methylation. So if they can get the B vitamins in a methylated form is much better. It's, it's readily available for detoxification, basically. And we need a whole host of minerals. So magnesium and others. And that's why we usually recommend Vegetable juices, they are rich in minerals. Uh, that's why we recommend bone broth and vegetable broth as well. Those vegetables and those, those bones, they will leach their minerals and amino acids in the water. And it will be really readily available for us. As soon as we drink it, it's really easy to digest. In a detox, we try to have the easiest to digest meals. And that's why uh, juices, smoothies, soups, bone broths, and etc. are recommended because they are easily digestible. Uh, definitely, but just don't forget to get the nutrients. The, the ones that we just mentioned are really the key ones. You kind of mentioned that there are many reasons why we should go into detox. So do you think that detox plans should be personalized to individuals' needs and preferences? Definitely, actually. We run group coaching programs for detox and for weight loss, but we always personalize the approach. So we have a personal intake questionnaire where people actually share with us their eating habits, their lifestyle, but also their health history so that we understand where they're coming from, when, what are the imbalances they're, they're having, what is their objective, of course, but we need to understand the background. If I have somebody who has a low thyroid uh, or hypothyroid uh, or Hashimoto's, the way we are going to do the detox will be different because we need those uh, sources of sulfur that comes usually with from cruciferous vegetables, but that comes with a lot of goitrogens. So goitrogens are going to stop them actually from absorbing the iodine to make enough thyroid hormones. And they are already hypothyroidic. So what they need is support rather than something that's going to tax their thyroid even more. In that case, actually, we try to help them in the way we prepare the food. So what helps to reduce the quantity of goitrogens in cruciferous vegetables, for example, is cooking them. The cooking will reduce actually the quantity by 60 to 80 percent which is already a significant amount uh, that is that we're not going to get in terms of goitrogens we're still getting actually the benefits of the sulfur but we're not getting like the harmful effect for those who have a, a thyroid kind of weakness our detox program is in three phases the first phase is we're actually supporting the colon the kidney actually to work and to be kind of drained the drainage is is correctly done so that when the liver starts actually detoxifying at a higher rate uh, the toxins when they arrive to the elimination organ and the biggest one that we have are the colon and the kidneys, they are ready actually to get the toxins out. If they are clogged, if they are not working properly, toxins will be reabsorbed. They will be stagnant and there will be reabsorption. And this is where we get sick. If I have somebody who has chronic constipation, for example, definitely we will not move into phase two where we will support liver detox. No, no, no. We stay, we try to support our colon to get better, to reduce this constipation as much as possible. And I already had one person in a whole program that never moved into phase two. The objective was first to support the colon to work better 
and address this chronic constipation. It was really a chronic, chronic constipation. She would have been just sicker and sicker if, if she moved into phase two. So I did not want her to do that. And she, we're still actually helping her actually to address this uh, constipation. There are many reasons why constipation can be there and chronic. And sometimes it's beyond food. It's really about stress. It's uh, about like a hypothyroid issue. There, there are many other reasons where, which are beyond food and where we should not be pushing too much. Um, I'd like now to move to the world of toxins because okay. obviously this is not a secret. You know, we are surrounded by toxins. We live in a very toxic world. Can you elaborate on why these toxins pose a danger to humans and more specifically to women? So there are, as you said, there are many toxins we are surrounded by and that we're facing. It does not mean that we absorb all of them, but we estimate nowadays that we have about seven 100 chemicals in the body that are not supposed to be there. Those chemicals have never been tested together. Those 700 have never been tested together. Usually what companies would do, they would they test them alone. They test them with the other chemicals that are in the same product. They cannot actually test them with the thousands and thousands of chemicals that exist on earth in general. But when those chemicals actually arrive to our body and they mix together, they create what we call the cocktail effect. And the cocktail effect is much more synergetic, so they create much bigger problems than when they are on their own. And, and this is something that really the, the researchers are, are finding nowadays. What we also found since the, the 20th century is we used to think that the dose made the poison. So like in the 15th century, we used to think, oh, if it, if it is just a small quantity of like toxins, it's okay. The, the, the body can handle. And actually in the 20th century, with research, etc., we realized that there are some toxins that are what we call endocrine disruptors, and they disrupt our hormones. And as our hormones work in teeny tiny doses, those disruptors, those chemicals, even in tiny doses like one part per million or two part per million, which is nothing. This is what we're talking about. Just to give a, a, an example to your listeners is like a, a drop in 20 Olympic swimming pools. So it's, it's, it's really nothing. We're not talking about uh, uh, like um, like milligrams. No, we're not even talking about milligrams. Is one part per million is nothing. And still, um, it can disrupt our hormones. So there are two things that happen with, with toxins. Um, toxins can disrupt our hormones or they can disrupt our enzymes. Every cell has receptors, a receptor for a hormone, and we have many hormones in the body. The hormone arrives, it has the right shape, it clips, it click with the hormonal receptor, and together they're going to activate our DNA. And once that is done, our genes actually say when we activate DNA with this hormone, etc., we sh the cell should do this, should create a protein or behave in a certain way. And it happens. But when you have an endocrine disruptor, this endocrine disruptor that can do two things. It can either mimic your hormones and you occupy the, the receptor. So in that case, your hormone cannot get there and, and do the work. Um, and this um, endocrine disruptor can actually on itself can activate our DNA. So if it does activate our DNA and in addition to our hormones, we have an overreaction because we have more molecules that resemble our hormones that do the, the right way. So we have an, like an amplification of what the cell is supposed to be doing. This is one, one thing. There is another uh, scenario where this endocrine disruptor is occupying the receptor, but it, it does not activate anything in the cell. So for example, the uh, enzymatic process that should happen in the cell, for example, if we think about insulin, insulin, when it clicks into the receptor and it's supposed actually to open the door for glucose to enter the cell and it does not happen. And the, the ATP, so the, the energy at the cellular level that is supposed to be created is not created, your cell is not having the energy to do the work. So your this cell and maybe other cells in your body, hundreds, thousands, will not do their work. So you are missing the kind of energy at the cellular level for so many cells. Slowly you start feeling fatigued, okay? This is where the fatigue is coming from because the, the enzymes that should be doing something are not doing it at, at that time. So I, I may be going into a little bit of detail, but just to explain the link between things. Uh, and it's very important to understand that, to, to think, okay, it's not because I'm lacking nutrients. No, no, no. It, it's somewhere else, actually. Let's take the example of the endocrine disruptors for estrogen. Estrogen is a very important uh, hormone for women. If we start having 
too much estrogen coming from outside, we produce our own estrogen, and then we have what we call xenoestrogen coming from outside the body. It can come from food, dairy, for example. Dairy is very rich in estrogen because cows, they produce uh, milk for their little ones to grow, okay? And they give them estrogen as well to grow. They give them other uh, growth hormones as well in the milk. But just to, to take the example of estrogen, milk and dairy in general is very rich in estrogen. Meat is rich in estrogen as well. Uh, but you can also have uh, estrogen in, a, in plants. You can have them, and that's what we call phytoestrogen. We have them in soy, we have them in flaxseed and, and, and other things, but actually they don't behave in the body the same way. Animal uh, sources of estrogen are not adaptogens, so they really occupy our receptors, the cellular receptors of the hormones, whereas the phytoestrogens are adaptogens. So if you need estrogen, for example, if you are in that phase of perimenopause, menopause, phytoestrogen is very helpful because it's it's adaptogen. If you need more, it will be there, it will help you. If you don't need it, actually it's there, it does not occupy as much animal um, estrogen sources. Okay, so this is something to bear in mind, but also you can find xenoestrogens in so many other things. Pesticides, phthalates, phthalates, it can be in plastic, but it can be also a support for fragrance. So fragrance, anything that has fragrance, has phthalates to support that fragrance to stay alive for months and months and years and years. So if you buy a detergent, for example, and you buy it and you don't use it or you use it or you don't use it actually for years, after 10 years, you open it, it still has the same smell. Why? Because it has phthalates. And phthalates actually have the same mimicking effect on our estrogen than, than our, estro our own estrogen. So it's very much disrupting to us. And, and anything that has fragrance is very bad to us. But also it has uh, anything with uh, bisphenols, for example. So the BPA, the BPS, all those things uh, are, are disrupting to our hormones. And there are many more. But just, just to give you uh, examples, I think that that's what I would say about how it is disrupting our hormones. There is this mimicking effect and blocking effect for our own hormones. Could you share some easy tips on reducing these exposures to environmental toxins? We could do that in many places in the house. We could, in the kitchen, we could maybe reduce our usage of plastic and especially the bad kind of plastic. Plastic will leach and there will be micro plastics that will leach into your food if it is hot, if it is acidic or if it is fat, okay? So if it, anything of those three kind of conditions, with those three conditions, we, we should not be using plastic, definitely. Use glass, use uh, stainless steel, uh, ceramic, anything you want, but not plastic in those situations. Maybe uh, changing your um, cookware from Teflon. Teflon contains PFAS, which are those forever chemicals that really disrupt into a lot of our hormones. Uh, and you can replace it by stainless steel, cast iron, ceramic. Ceramic is not amazing, but ceramic is very handy. It, it's like the base is aluminium, which is not great, but there are five layers of ceramic uh, and those five layers of ceramic, and they are not as toxic as Teflon. So, but, but usually it wears off. So after two years, three years, if your kids cook with it, if your teens, you have teenagers that cook with it, it will wear off much quicker, to be honest. So you have to replace it. But the, the kind of the most sustainable solution, stainless steel, and cast iron. Cast iron is a little bit heavy, but that's maybe good for strength training. So that's, that's a good option. So that was the kitchen, but also in the bathroom. So in the bathroom, the idea is really to reduce conventional beauty products. We, we sell them as beauty products, uh, cosmetics. Uh, in your lipstick, you have heavy metals and actually it's very close to your mouth. So you will end up actually eating some of those heavy metals. Heavy metals are very much disrupting to our cells. Uh, not only in our hormones, yes, to our hormones, our cells, our enzymes. So unfortunately, is not great. Uh, so if you put a lot of makeup on your body, some part of it, not all of it, but some part of it will be absorbed and will need to be detoxified. Fragrance, as we mentioned before, is another thing. So fragrance is 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 present in, in many things. So it's, it can be in candles, like scented candles, detergents, laundry products, face creams, shampoos, many things. What is the thing that is the most present in your life? Because we don't have the same habits and, and lifestyles so that I cannot give like one, one thing that works for everybody. But look at your life and, and think about, okay, what are, what is the exposure that I have most 
from all what has been described. And, and, and then this is maybe the, the, this is the 20% that I will focus on that will bring the 80% of the benefits. Okay. And there are actually just to come back to cosmetics and detergents, etc. There are so many cleaner brands. They're not necessarily 100%, but they are cleaner, which is, which is already a great win. We're not trying to do 100%. We're just trying to reduce exposure. Our detoxification system is in place and it can do the work for us. We just don't want to overload it. Throughout your journey of supporting women, what has been the most rewarding aspect for you personally? Two things. I, I love when I see health transformations because this is what basically brought me to change my own life and my family's life. So I think health transformations and I have seen so many good, it can be just in that matter of 10 days of, of, of detox. I had, for instance, one participant who had breast infection and it was every month, basically. Every time she was uh, having her cycle, her, uh, her infection will come back. And she, she had actually to, uh, to, to, to get actually rid of pus from her, uh, from her breast every month. Uh, she was taking anti-inflammatory medication, except every month. And now she came to this detox program where she heard so much great, I mean, people talking about it positively. She said, okay, let's, let's do that. Not, not really thinking that she was going to do anything for her problem. And here you go. I actually she started just the first day of the detox and the first day where we don't do much actually the first day we just start the elimination which is let's reduce toxic food and anything which is difficult to digest will reduce it this is what we did day one and she was knackered and tired by like 6 p 6 p.m she was like asma i'm really tired i don't understand what is happening we did not even start detox we were like far, far away from detox, but still she was already having lots of impact on her health. Basically, we, re we re reduced uh, difficult to digest. We removed anything which is toxic, but we, of course we replaced it by vegetables, by food which is rich in nutrients. But, but just, this is just the basic things of food, which we did not bring anything. We did not bring um, supplements or herbs or detoxifying herbs. Not yet. We did not do any of this. It was just that. And she was so tired. She went to sleep. 6, 7, 7 p.m. She went to sleep. The next morning, she felt much better. But, and, and slowly, she started actually having changes and feeling and sharing and, 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 and describing. But actually, she was applying. Every day, she was applying more and more because she felt much better every day. By the end of the, the detox, she shared with me that she was feeling much better, etc. And at the end, actually, when, we, when her cycle came back, etc., she said, well, Asma, I don't have any pus anymore. I don't understand what is happening. But And, and she went to see her doctor and they checked, etc. And they said, well, it's much better. Actually, what we did, we reduced inflammation. We reduced, um, we supported her, her immune system to work better. We did basic things. Severine, we did not do anything special, really. It was just basic food. And, and still, this lady had a huge transformation because actually in her diet, when what I had realized later on, in her diet, she did not used to eat uh, much vegetables. She used to have a tomato, maybe a cucumber in a day. So that was the, the kind of amount of vegetables she used to have. And therefore, she was lacking lots of nutrients. As soon as she started feeding her body and bringing those just basic, normal, essential nutrients, her body responded very quickly. And her transformation was, was really amazing. And now she is an advocate. She is an advocate and she's trying to help her dad. She, he has like um, a hypertension. So she's trying, okay, so you know what? Maybe it's because of inflammation and try to do this and try to do that, which I love. This is exactly what motivates me is to see people not only have health transformation, but become advocates and try to help others, which is exactly what we want. For those eager to connect with you, watch your master classes or try uh, your detox programs, What's the best way for them to reach out? We have a website. It's My Authentic Spoon. Uh, authentic with a K because we want it to be special and a little bit quirky to each person because we are very unique and different. So myauthenticspoon.com. And uh, we have an uh, Instagram account, a Facebook account, but we are much more active on Instagram, LinkedIn as well. But what we do is really 
what I mentioned before is those awareness campaigns. Each month, we have a theme uh, where we try really to raise awareness about a health topic and help people to understand it much better and to start taking actions. This month was about detox and, and hence our discussion uh, with, with you, Severine. And next month is going to be about the hormonal dimension of weight gain. Maybe you're not able to lose weight because your hormones are out of whack. And when we say hormones, we usually think about estrogen and progesterone. But actually, there are other hormones that can be out of whack. And one of them is insulin. And another could be cortisol because of stress. And it could be thyroid. Maybe you have, you, you, you're you not hypothyroidic, but maybe you have an under-functioning thyroid. When your metabolism is slowed down because of that, everything will everything will slow down and so you're not burning that energy that you're supposed to and gaining weight because of that so there are many many reasons why we could be gaining weight and people usually go on a kind of weight loss diet where they reduce their calorie intake they exercise more thinking that that's the best way actually to lose weight but it's not true that can be part of the problem of course if your intake is 3000 calories and you're only burning 2000 for example of course there is a mismatch here but most people that's not the case for most people that's not the case it's it, they're not overeating but there are in what they eat it's the, maybe the problem in the stress that they're having etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, what i can encourage people is to Check out actually our Instagram and our, our website uh, and, and have actually the kind of the list of conferences that we are organizing. There, we have some conferences here in, in the UAE, but we have a lot which are online. Some are in French, others are in English. So you can find the date that works best for you. Register, attend and ask your questions. The most important thing is to first take, the first action is to understand and get the education and then customize it to yourself. So that's why I really encourage people to come and, and, and participate in those conferences because that's the first action actually to start changing something towards the a better health and, and lifestyle as well. Well, that's it for today. A massive thank you to my wonderful guest, Asma, and to all of you for watching. All the links and resources that we mentioned in this podcast are going to be linked down the video description. Leave a comment down below and ask any question or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. If you enjoyed this episode, you may want to check out this episode here. So thanks for watching. Do hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And I'll see you soon. Bye.